broadly, um, I will, I, I would always be much more inclined uh, to move in response to complaints about the two-thirds requirement when it comes from, minority, from a minority party rather than a majority, because in both parties, when Republicans and Democrats talk about it, it sounds more like ideological convenience than it sounds like deep held concerns about government reform. Now, Bob, in his position at CGS, is not a partisan advocate. And he raises the reasonable point, wouldn't things work more smoothly if things could be done by majority vote? Um, and there's no question that things could be done more quickly. And so I guess what I would say, coming back to my earlier point, which is if you support the agenda of the majority party, whether it's raising taxes or lowering taxes, whether it's passing health care or putting certain types of judges on the federal courts, then moving more quickly is a good thing. If you don't necessarily agree with that position, then it's a bad, uh, then it's, then it's a bad option. Um, California Forward, the reform organization based up in the Bay Area, has a proposal that will allow budgets to be passed on a two-thirds vote, uh, on a majority vote, but would require a two-thirds vote uh, in order to raise taxes. Now, I think that's problematic for all sorts of reasons, but it's a legitimate starting point for a discussion about how to make government work more efficiently while still preserving the, the rights of the minority. Jumping in back. Uh, what, uh, what recommendations would you make to uh, young people entering politics in terms of how they should develop themselves now to be able to assume positions of leadership? Uh, it's a great question. Advice to young people who are considering getting involved in politics. It's interesting, I gave a talk yesterday in Sacramento to a League of Cities conference uh, featuring local elected officials who are thinking about running for state legislature. And I told them, what I'm going to talk about today is number one, why it's, miser why it's a miserable job, and number two, why you should do it anyway. And I'm guessing by the uh, basis of your question, it's something that you are considering, and if that's true, I congratulate you for it. Because it is a tough, difficult, nasty job. Uh, but anybody who is willing to give up themselves, to sacrifice time or energy, financial reward, time with family, whatever the sacrifices may be, in order to give up themselves to make their community a better place to live is the most honorable of citizens. And if it is something you're considering, you deserve all the credit and all the uh, uh, congratulations in the world for it. What advice would I give you? Uh, a couple of things. Uh, I would, long before you begin your first race, I would make a point of getting to know people, not just within your own party structure, whichever party that may happen to be, but both. Get to know your entire community. So I think one of the biggest challenges we face, and hopefully this is something we can talk about a little bit later, although it goes beyond state politics and uh, the state of the national political dialogue, one of the biggest challenges we face in terms of public service, but also with the citizenry, um, is that while the advances in communications technology have empowered us to participate in a national political conversation in a way that we never could have before, it's also sort of isolated us. Um, think of my iPod. Think of my iPod as a metaphor for all the various forms of communications technology. Cable television, talk radio, internet. Best thing about my iPod is that it's empowering. I can listen whatever I want to, whenever I want to. The bad thing about it is that it's isolated. Because as soon as I put those white plugs in my ears, I very quickly lose any interest in, in what you're listening to. One person watches MSNBC, the other watches Fox. One likes Olbermann, the other one likes O'Reilly. One reads Huffington, the other likes Hannity. And very quickly, you're not just coming to different opinions about things, but you're, entirely, you're occupying two entirely different versions of reality. My father, as some of you know, is a very liberal Democrat. My father, five years ago, voted for Howard Dean for president of the Wisconsin primary, even though he thought Dean was too conservative, he held his nose. My father and stepmother uh, used the V-chip on their television set to block out the Fox News channel. <laughs> but when he and I were growing up, when, when I was growing up uh, back in Wisconsin, he and I watched the evening news together. And even if we came to different conclusions about what we saw, at least we're drinking from the same pool of information. I think one of the biggest difficulties we see, not so much in local government, but again, getting up to Sacramento, that goes back to the disconnection that Kathy was talking about, 
is people in both parties of all ideologies who mistake their immediate environment for the entire political landscape. So I guess the first piece of advice I give you is come to the waterfront. Don't just talk to the people who can help you get elected. Talk to the people who can help you govern once you get there. That's a much broader base of people. Would you care to comment about the fairness doctrine? Would I care to comment about the fairness doctrine? That's <laughs> um, a, a, a little bit far afield from, uh, from state politics, I suppose. Um, but my own opinion is that in an era where there are, well, let me back up a second. I talked about watching the news with my dad a zillion years ago growing up in Wisconsin. Well, I watched the news, even at age 15, because it's 6.30 at night. I didn't have a lot of options. I could watch the news on ABC, I could watch the news on NBC, I could watch the news on CBS, or I could watch, watch Gilligan's Island on Channel 57. And if I had already seen that episode of Gilligan's Island, you know, the one where they almost got off the island. <laughs> <laughs> um, I watched the news. So again, the great thing about these communications technologies is they're empowering. I can, should I choose, watch CNN and the other cable channels for 23 hours a day and drink in information at a rate that was unheard of in the, 19, uh, in the 1980s. Um, and so I guess what I think is that the fairness doctrine that was developed at a time when there were three broadcast networks and no cable television and no internet to speak of, I think needs to be revisited um, at a time when there are 1,000 cable channels and an unlimited number of internet sites that provide news and information and opinion. I don't know what the answer is, but I, I, I worry that the supposition on all sides of this debate, on all sides, is that we still live in not a binary, a trinary, is that a word? <laughs> in a trinary, yeah, uh, with a trinary set of, of, uh, of news and information sources. And that's simply not the case. And while the marketplace, as we've seen in some areas, doesn't necessarily work its magic unfettered, as we saw in Wall Street last fall, I would say that the marketplace of ideas on cable television, on the radio, and on the internet um, does meet some parameters. But those parameters need to be developed in a much radically different way than when Rather and Jennings and Brokaw uh, formed a, uh, uh, a mutual monopoly on the dissemination of news every night. To, to go onto that a little bit, how do you, and, and to put on um, your old hat as a political strategist, how do you form a consensus in a world uh, on an issue like whether it be the California budget, national health care, whatever? in a world where information is so fragmented and where people have gone to their opposite corners and they're completely happy to stay there? The answer is, you go to those corners. Mm -hmm. I think one of the big mistakes we've seen over the last several years in national politics by leaders of both parties, and then at a, at a lesser level in state politics as well, um, is the idea that mobilizing your own base, your own parts of an ideological base, is a sufficient way of governing. And what we've learned from the leaders of both parties is base mobilization, turning out your most conservative Republicans, your most liberal Democrats, is a very efficient way of getting elected. It's a lousy way of preparing to govern. 